In 1271, the Mongol leader Kublai Khan established the Yuan dynasty, becoming its first emperor and extending Mongol rule to become the ruler of the Great Yuan and Great Mongolia. Kublai Khan continued his campaign southward against the Song dynasty, while also turning his attention eastward. Launching an attack on Goryeo, Kublai Khan ultimately made it a vassal state of the Mongol Empire. With Goryeo under Mongol control, Japan, just across the strait, became Kublai Khan's next target. Historical records prior to approximately 618 AD scarcely offered praise for Japan, portraying it as desolate and barbaric, with most inhabitants described as rough and discourteous. However, from the 8th century onwards, rumors of Japan's great wealth began to circulate, corresponding with the historical event in 749 AD when placer gold was discovered in northern Japan and subsequently exported for the next 400 years. In the 9th century, an Islamic scholar described a country called Wakwak, where monkeys wore collars made of gold. Meanwhile, officials of the Chinese Tang Dynasty were astonished by the reported annual salary of Japanese envoys, estimated to be around 5 kilograms of gold. However, what they saw represented only a fraction of reality. It's estimated that Japan's annual gold production at the time did not exceed 10% of that of the entire East Asia. Nonetheless, rumors of a land of gold spread fueled by people's curiosity. As the highest ruler of the Mongol Empire, Kublai Khan must have also heard similar rumors. Driven by greed, the Mongols, lacking any maritime technology, began to view Japan as their next target. At that time, Japan was ruled by the eighth generation of the Kamakura shogunate, Hojo Tokimune. Starting from 1266, Diplomatic envoys composed of Mongols and Goryeo emissaries had repeatedly approached Japan, demanding submission to the Mongols, but Japan disregarded their requests. In the summer of 1269, the Mongol envoy arrived in Japan once again, addressing the Emperor of Japan as the king of a small country in the documents he brought. Unquestionably, the envoy was promptly expelled from the country, and the insults Japan suffered finally led Kublai Khan to decide to conquer it using the Mongols' military prowess. Sensing the Mongol threat, Hojo Tokimune ordered Shoni Tsukiyoshi to lead troops to Kyushu to deploy defenses. This region was closest to Goryeo's territory, and thus most likely to be the first target of invasion. Kublai Khan also began assembling troops for the invasion of Japan. He ordered Goryeo to construct over 900 warships. The coalition army consisted of troops from the Han, Mongol, and Jurchen ethnic groups, totaling approximately 15,000, along with 12,000 soldiers from Goryeo, making a total force of about 30,000. The highest commander was the Mongol Hundun, with the deputies being Han Lufuheng and Goryeo's Hong Tagu and Kim Bangjiao. Undoubtedly, since the main forces were engaged in the war against the Song dynasty, the leaders invading Japan were not the most skilled. Moreover, they lacked experience in naval warfare. The scale of the first expedition to Japan was not very large, leading some to believe that it was essentially a probing attack, with the ultimate goal not being the complete conquest of Japan. Between the Japanese archipelago and the East Asian mainland lies the narrowest stretch, only 180 kilometers wide. For ships traveling from the mainland to Japan, this is undoubtedly the optimal departure point. On November 2, 1274, the expeditionary force set out from here, gradually coming to a halt upon sighting a great black solitary island, Tsushima Island. Guarding Tsushima Island, so Sukakuni had already received warnings of a possible Mongol invasion. Therefore, he swiftly led his son, brothers, and some local militia, totaling less than 100 men, to the beach overnight, preparing defenses to resist the Mongol landing. The first wave of Mongol troops exceeded 1,000 men, outnumbering so Sukakuni's forces tenfold. As per Japanese combat tradition, upon sighting the Mongols, So Sukakuni signaled the start of battle by firing a loud arrow. Then, each side sent forth a commander to announce their name before engaging in single combat. After So Sukakuni fired the signal arrow, the Mongols responded with a hail of arrows. Subsequently, the Mongol troops swiftly organized into formations of ten or a hundred, advancing collectively. 
In a short time, all Japanese warriors fell in battle, including Sosukakuni and his kinsmen. The outcome of the battle was bloody. Following Mongol custom, since Tsushima Island did not surrender, the soldiers were allowed to plunder freely. After occupying Tsushima Island, perhaps busy with pillaging or exhausted from their first boat ride, it took over a week before they began boarding again, setting sail for their next target, Japan's Iki Island. This time, the Mongol army dispatched only two ships carrying over 400 men for the landing on Iki Island. Similar to Tsushima Island, the defenses on Iki Island were also modest, lacking significant defensive forces. Like Sukakuni Terra no Kajitaka led a force of over 100 men to confront them. He planned to leverage the familiarity with the terrain, engaging the Mongols in archery exchanges within the island's forests, taking cover behind trees. However, after the engagement began, the Mongols' arrows proved fierce and accurate. Just when the Japanese soldiers found it difficult to resist, thunderous explosions erupted amidst the crowd. The Mongol army had deployed the thundercrashers they learned from the Song dynasty. These were spherical iron shells filled with black powder, lit and hurled towards the enemy. Terra no Kajitaka led the remaining men to escape into the city as night fell. With the Mongols refraining from further assaulting the city that night, the next day saw the energetic Mongol forces launching a full-scale assault on the city, which lasted from morning till night. Inside the city, the Japanese defenders were reduced to a few dozen wounded soldiers. Realizing the inevitable fate of capture, Terra no Kajitaka instructed his able-bodied retainers to first kill the elderly and children before committing suicide himself by seppuku. With the capture of Iki Island, the Mongols, as they did on Tsushima Island, commenced widespread looting and slaughter. Five days later, Iki Island lay in ruins. As the Mongol troops plundered the island, ships fleeing from Iki Island brought back the grim news to Japan. Shoni Tsukiyoshi, the supreme commander in Japan, received only reports of defeat, leaving all of Kyushu and the shogunate highly tense. Urgently, they gathered reinforcements from various regions. Mongol warships had already anchored in Hakata Bay, but due to the shallow waters of the beach, the main vessels could not dock directly, soldiers had to be ferried ashore in batches using smaller boats. The Mongol army planned to land from three positions, with the main force of over 10,000 led by Deputy Marshal Lu Fuing, aiming to occupy the beaches of Hakata Bay. Nearby Hakata Bay, a large number of Japanese troops also gathered. As the Mongols approached the shore in small boats, the Japanese immediately prepared to repel them with arrows. However, before their arrows could be fired, the beach was rocked by explosions. The catapults on the Mongol warships had begun their attack, hurling huge rocks and explosive shells at the Japanese troops. Coordinated with the catapults and thunderous firecrackers, Mongol archers overwhelmed the Japanese defenses at all three landing points. Apart from the disparity in weaponry, the equipment of both sides was vastly different. Only a few Japanese soldiers charging towards the well-prepared Mongol forces had full armor. Shoni Tsukiyoshi, the Japanese commander, began to gather scattered soldiers and retreated to the water fortress for defense. As night fell, most of the Japanese soldiers sought refuge within the fortress. The Mongols realized the fortress's hidden defenses would be difficult to breach quickly, especially under the cover of darkness. With nightfall, the Mongol forces withdrew to their warships. Inside the fortress, the Japanese soldiers, already demoralized by the daytime defeat and suffering from injuries, faced an uncertain future, with even the most optimistic commanders unsure how long they could hold out. In the early morning of the second day, the tense Japanese soldiers, having endured a sleepless night, discovered that the Mongol army had not launched the expected fierce assault on the fortress. With no Mongol ships visible at sea, Shoni Tsukiyoshi remained cautious, fearing a Mongol trick. He dispatched numerous soldiers for reconnaissance, only to receive reports that the Mongols had already retreated. The previous night, Mongol commander Hundun concluded that Japan had amassed a large number of soldiers and fortified the city defenses, making a swift victory unlikely. As a raid, they had carried minimal provisions, which were now dwindling. Without penetrating inland, 
they couldn't plunder civilians. With many prisoners and spoils already captured, the best course was to return to Goryeo. After hours of deliberation, Hun Dun and Lu Fuheng eventually persuaded other commanders to abandon the assault and retreat under the cover of night. Thus, the Mongol expedition to Japan came to an end. During their return journey, the retreating Mongol army encountered a storm. While the commanders safely made it back, half of the soldiers were lost. Nonetheless, both Mongols and Japanese considered the retreat a victory. Kublai Khan once again set envoys to make Japan a vassal state, while Japan, viewing the Mongol retreat as a triumph, no longer expelled the envoys. Hojo Tokimune had all Mongol envoys killed and began constructing a 20-kilometer, 2-meter high stone wall along the coast of Hakata Bay to prevent future Mongol landings. With the envoys killed, Mongolia was bound to invade Japan again. In 1281, the second Mongol invasion began, boasting a force close to 150,000, significantly larger than the first. The main contingent, as before, departed from Goryeo, numbering over 40,000 and led by Mongol commander Hundun. The rest comprised over 100,000 soldiers from Jiangnan, mainly defectors from the Song dynasty, under the command of surrendered Song general Fan Wenhu. Kublai Khan was unsure how to handle these defectors, fearing they might turn into bandits if left unchecked. Thus, seizing the opportunity, Kublai Khan dispatched them all to Japan. Even if Japan couldn't be conquered and they all perished in battle, it would relieve Kublai Khan of a burden. In early May, the expedition from Goryeo once again easily took control of Tsushima Island and Iki Island. Before joining forces with the Jiangnan army, they headed straight to Hakata Bay on the Japanese mainland, aiming to capture Kyushu. However, Japan was now well prepared. Tens of thousands of troops stood behind the stone wall at Hakata Bay. The Mongol fleet prowled the seas, unable to find a suitable landing point, while Japan sent out warships to continuously harass the Mongol rear. After failing to find a suitable landing point, the Mongol army reluctantly chose to temporarily land on Shika Island, initiating a struggle centered around the waters. A week later, realizing they couldn't gain an advantage, the Mongol forces retreated to Iki Island. During a military council, Commander Hundun once again proposed retreat, but Goryeo General Kim Bangjiang vehemently opposed. He argued that the provisions brought along could sustain them for another month, allowing them to await the arrival of the Jiangnan army and seek an opportunity for a decisive battle. Led by Fan Wenhu, the Jiangnan army departed from Jujiang three days later than scheduled for the rendezvous. After waiting for ten days on Iki Island, the expeditionary forces from Goryeo finally received the arrival of the Jiangnan troops. With the arrival of substantial reinforcements, the Mongol army prepared to launch a proactive attack by the end of July, making final preparations for the assault on Kyushu. On the night of August 1st, a historically significant super typhoon suddenly appeared, sweeping through the entire Mongol fleet. Overnight, numerous warships and soldiers were submerged beneath the waves. When the typhoon passed, the expeditionary fleet was scattered, and the Japanese forces immediately launched attacks from all sides. The Mongol commanders and generals had no choice but to retreat hastily. The second Mongol invasion of Japan came to an end due to the typhoon. Less than 10% of the entire invading force returned alive. Both invasions of Japan were heavily impacted by encounters with maritime storms. The Japanese of the time attributed these storms to the work of kami, or gods, who destroyed the invading forces. This belief later inspired Japan to organize the Kamikaze Special Attack Units during World War II to combat the Allies, with Kamikaze deriving its name from these events.